Hi guys, so today I'd like to help you maximize your performance by understanding intended training stimulus. Simply, this is what the coach who programmed your workout was looking for you to achieve during that workout. And it's really important to understand, especially those of you that are training from home and just following workouts either on a video or even just, un even just looking at the workout on our software, you really need to know what's actually intended from that workout to get the most out of it. There's several elements to the intended training stimulus and we'll start with a simple workout and I'll break down that workout into stages. So let's start with one of the most popular workouts in CrossFit and that is the workout Fran. The first thing to look at in our training stimulus is what movement patterns are we trying to train and what modalities are we using in that training session. So Fran, for those of you that don't know, is 21.59 thrusters and pull-ups. So 21.59 means you perform 21 of each exercise before moving on to the next round. So you will do 21 thrusters, which is a squat to an overhead press, followed by 21 pull-ups, which you should know what that is by now, but it's a chin over the bar, and then 15 thrusters, 15 pull-ups, nine thrusters, nine pull-ups. If we just look at the movement patterns we're looking to achieve and the, the, the muscles we're looking to train during that workout, the thruster is very simply a lower body squat or a lower body push pattern, followed by an upper body vertical press as well. The pull-up is an upper body pulling pattern. Thrusters are a weightlifting movement because you are moving an external weight. Pull-ups are what we class in CrossFit as a gymnastic movement in which you are moving only your body weight. We can easily substitute thrusters if we don't have a barbell. It's an easy one to substitute if you're doing this workout with limited equipment. You could just use any object to add load and press that overhead. If you have a single dumbbell, you could perform it one single arm at a time. Depending on the load, we'll talk about how, how you scale the reps, but you can perform both arms or just combine them and do maybe 21 on one arm and 21 on the other, or split the reps into two groups of 11, and we'll go 22 reps on that first round. For the pull-ups, the scaling and the modifying of those is slightly more challenging, depending on, first of all, your ability, and secondly, what equipment you have to hand. So we're looking to recreate a vertical pull, now we can do that by, if you have a pull-up bar and you just can't quite manage to pull up, you can add some bands to it to help you assist yourself on those. I've discussed before about whether the value of that is, is worth it. Definitely not if you're using really, really heavy bands. I think if you are close, it can be useful. You could perform a jumping pull-up. Again, that's going to recreate that vertical pull. But again, it depends on how close you are to pull-up and how much of the the movement becomes a jump and therefore a, a calf exercise and a lower body jumping movement and how much it becomes a pulling movement. That's why we want to understand the stimulus because the stimulus is to try and train these pulling muscles and if it becomes a jumping motion, you're not training to the intended stimulus for that workout. More likely is we'll replace that pull up with some form of inverted row, either with rings, with a towel tied around something or with a barbell or, or anything we can hang off. Some of you may watch my previous video on pull-up options at home. So there's an option you can vary from, or we can use an external load. It's not as ideal because we're looking for Fran to be a weightlifting movement with the, with the thrusters and then a gymnastic movement with the pull-up, but we can replace it with some weights. It's not impossible, but it's almost impossible to recreate a vertical pull with weights without a machine because the vertical pull is this way and therefore to train with weights, we'd have to go upside down and pull the weights that way. So it is possible, but I'm sure if you could go upside down and do dumbbell pulls, then you probably have an option to do some pull-ups. We've got the movement patterns there. So we've got the thrusters and we have the gymnastic movement in the, the pull-ups. That's the, the movement stimulus. That's what we're looking to achieve in terms of movement patterns. And the muscles we're trying to train, obviously with the thrusters will be lower body with the legs, an upper body press as well. And as with all of this stuff, we're generally training the midline because when you're trying to coordinate that press and that, that load overhead, we also need to make sure we're keeping our midline strong so we're not losing any posture. 
And in the pull-ups, we're training the upper back and the arms. We understand that first of all, so we understand the movement patterns we're looking to train. The second thing is to look at what sort of intensity that workout should be worked at. And that is often shown by the weight that we prescribe and also the reps. And finally, what the intended finish time for that workout is. And it's really difficult to, to do a workout without knowing those numbers, the, the weight and also the intended finish time. So the weight for guys in, in Fran is 45 kilos. If you haven't trained before, that number means absolutely nothing to you. But we use RX as a guide for people to understand the stimulus of a workout. The reason we have an RX number is, yes, it's aspirational. It's good for people to work towards. That's what we consider that some of the fittest athletes in the box will train at. But it's also a guide in terms of the, the loading. So 45 in CrossFit terms for something that is overhead is considered moderately light. In other words, some people may get close to completing every round of those thrusters unbroken, which means they do all of the reps without putting the bar down. The majority of people should be able to complete that, those rounds in two sets. So you put it down, have a short rest, and then complete it again. And that's what 45 describes in terms of the intended stimulus. So when you are training on your own, you should be looking to match a weight to that stimulus because we are looking to train muscular endurance but it's a high intensity fast workout so fran is we're looking for fran to be completed in around the four minute mark for our fittest athletes so those people that are doing it rx should be looking to hit that four minute mark we don't mind if they are maybe one or two minutes behind that and a little bit slower because they want to work on building their strength up in the thrusters. But when people start just completing Fran and ending up doing the thrusters in sets of three, taking 10 minutes or more, they are not performing that workout to its intended stimulus, which is high threshold, high intensity, sprint type pace. Most workouts that you see in CrossFit that are programmed 21, 15, 9 are intended to perform close to your lactate threshold. Therefore, when you finish, you should be absolutely dead on your feet. And the same applies to the pull-ups. Now, it's more difficult to understand that because for some people, 21 pull-ups is really, really easy. And for other people, 21 pull-ups is aspirational at best. The understanding on when, when we're trying to convey this workout, though, is that the 21 on both sides should be very similar in how you break it down in the those of you that maybe aren't the best at pull-ups, maybe two to three sets, those of you that are really good and have your kipping or your butterfly style pull-up can complete those pull-ups unbroken throughout. And that means you need to scale the pull-ups or modify the pull-ups to a movement in which it will take you two to three sets. So if you're scaling to an inverted row, you need to incline yourself to just the right amount that it's going to challenge you and that you maybe, maybe could do it unbroken for that first set of 21 but it should be at your limit i would suggest that if you're looking to we we again adjust our, our stimulus depending on what our needs are but if your goal is to get towards a pull-up then maybe you need to make those inverted rows slightly more challenging to make them that you have to do in three sets maybe a set of 10 set of six and a set of five or something around that combination to train that strength that you're looking for to get you closer towards your pull-up so again we have an intended stimulus for that workout, but you can slightly amend it, not hugely, but slightly amend it to fit your needs. And I would suggest that would be the way to go is look at your desire, your goal, and work that way around it. So we adjust the thrusters in a weight that takes us two to three sets at most. One set if you're already at the RX weight. And again, just a pull-ups to fit. If we have a barbell, that's easy you change the weight. If you are limited with equipment, this is where the difficulty arrives with at-home training is that we are slightly more limited in our equipment and we may have to modify the workout slightly so we won't necessarily hit exactly the same stimulus as if we were in the gym training, if we we're in the box here training. 
In that case, we just have to get the, the intensity of the workout to match what we want. We have to get the timing of the workout to match what we want and the movement patterns to get as close as we can. That way we can get as close as we can to matching the stimulus for that workout. So for example, if you only have a, a moderate weight dumbbell, in order to get that feeling of burning out after one set, you might end up doing 21 reps on each side. Or if it's lighter, you might even increase those reps and those thrusters to 30 and go 30, 20, 10, just to make sure you're getting that feeling that you're close to burning out on those thrusters each side. The same if you have an odd object, you may need to adjust the reps. Yes, ideally, we're looking to work at a, at a weight range where 21 becomes challenging for one set. But if we cannot get that, that way that heavy, then we adjust the reps to match as close as we can get to that stimulus and to match the timing wise, because obviously if you are able to do 30 light thrusters really quick and then switch sides, then that's what we will need to do. And the same for your pull-up variation. So you do need to adjust, you know, if we're in the gym, it's easy. We can adjust the, the weight, the loading. We can have a little bit more adjustment in the pull-ups, but if you're at home, you may need to adjust the reps as well to match that intended stimulus. Now, as I've just explained, we're looking for that workout to be around four minutes. So there may be occasions, and if you look at some of the fittest athletes on earth, where that workout actually becomes too easy for people. So the, the RX, although it's a, a target number, that's just a guide. And if we have fitter athletes, athletes that are ready to compete in sanctional events and CrossFit Games events, 21, 15, 9 at 45 and regular pull-ups is too easy and they will complete their workout in one minute 15. They just can't improve on that workout. So for them to get the benefit from their training, they would need to make it more challenging. Now that may be increasing the load to something like 65 and increasing the load on the pull-ups by maybe wearing a weighted vest or increasing the range of motion on the pull-ups to do chest to bar pull-ups. That would be a way of them matching the stimulus too. And that's, I described CrossFit from my golf background as having a handicapping system in that Whoever's training, whether it's a beginner or a CrossFit game athlete, they should be looking at completing their workout with the same stimulus and therefore around the same time. So you may have someone, if you're in the gym doing their workout, completing that workout with an empty bar or even a training bar that only weighs five kilos for their thrusters and then doing ring rows almost horizontal, or sorry, yeah, almost vertical with their torso, like so. And then they'll be competing against a CrossFit Games athlete who's got 65 kilos on the bar doing, I don't know, weighted chest to bar pull-ups maybe to get the, the same feeling. And then you may have a really close competition between the two of them, and that will help to build the intensity of the workout as well, which will get them even more benefit from that workout because it will push them to a higher level of training, working at a high intensity, working at a higher speed, improving their performance as well. That's the beauty of CrossFit and it comes from training stimulus and matching that. I'd like to go through a few more workouts now to give you a better understanding of that training stimulus and how that works throughout. And I'm going to use some classic workouts here. I'm going to start with the hero workout, Murph. Murph is a one mile run, 100 pull-ups, 200 press-ups, 300 squats, followed by a one mile run, performed with a weight vest is the RX. Murph is an unusual workout, however, because when it was first programmed, it was said that you can petition the reps any way which you choose. Normally, when you see a CrossFit workout, you must perform it as written. With Murph, you have the option to petition those reps however you choose, unless the coach who is programming it for that day specifies you must complete in a certain way. Now, what that means is you can really change the stimulus of that workout depending on how you choose to perform it. For example, if you perform that workout as written, so you perform the one mile run, then the 100 pull-ups, followed by the 200 press-ups, 300 squats, and then the one mile run, it becomes a very slow, low-intensity endurance piece. Unless you are capable of doing 100 unbroken pull-ups, 200 unbroken press-ups, and 300 unbroken squats all the way through, you are most likely going to be breaking it down and doing the pull-ups, having a rest, doing the pull-ups and having a rest to let your muscles recover because it's a muscular endurance piece and therefore it will take you a long time to complete that workout in that fashion. But it won't be so much that you will be 
at a super high intensity, your heart rate will drop during that workout. It'll just be a matter of getting through. It'll be a mental test and an endurance test, muscular endurance. Conversely, if you break it down as we often do to a 20 round workout where you complete 20 rounds of the five pull-ups, 10 press-ups, 15 squats, the intensity is increased because you can rest the muscles that you use on, on one exercise with the two following exercises. So for example, pull-ups, you will be resting to some extent on the press-ups and definitely resting on the air squats and so on and so forth throughout the different exercises. That raises the intensity of that workout a lot, decreases the time which you complete the work. And obviously if we're completing the same volume of work in a shorter time, we can say that the intensity of that workout is greater. We could make the workout super intense if we were allowed to break the run down as well and complete, let's say, a 160 meter run, 20 rounds of time of the same rep breakdown. That would be a really high intensity piece because the run would give us a greater opportunity to rest our body weight movements and we could sprint the run because we will be resting to some extent. We will be recovering from that sprint, doing those body weight movements. Therefore, our time will be much faster and that would be 20 high intensity rounds. Three different ways to perform the workout that gives you three different stimulus for that workout. And because Murph is, is allowed to be broken down that way, we can't say there is a set stimulus for that workout. It's just really the goal is to complete that workout however we choose. Other workouts are definitely, and the majority of workouts, especially when we program them, we have an intention for that workout. If we don't have an intention, how can we program with a plan to cover all of the areas of fitness and all the elements of fitness, all the training systems? We won't because people will choose, pick and choose and, and do certain workouts in a certain way. We want to make sure that we are programming them in a way that people have to hit that intended stimulus. So when we write workouts, generally the weight is one of the defining factors as well as the time domains and the rep scheme. So for example, a good workout to highlight that would be a workout such as Marston. And Marston, if you don't know, is a 20 minute AMRAP. So it's a time priority workout, 20 minutes to complete as many rounds and reps as possible of one deadlift at around 145, 10 toaster bar, 15 bar facing burpees. Because the weight of the workout is so high, it means that it's effectively based around this deadlift. That's the defining factor of the workout. It's effectively going to be doing one heavy deadlift, which for a lot of people will be pretty high on there, close to their max. I would say a 145 means generally it's going to be intended for someone whose one rep max is about 180. So you're going to be working at somewhere around 70 to 80% of your one rep max deadlift. The 10 toaster bar, 10 is a number that a lot of people can complete unbroken or in two sets. And that's where you're looking to scale yourself to fit that. And obviously the bar facing burpees, they're going to be the bit that defines the faster and slower athletes. And we can think about whether we need to scale those or not. So if we were performing that and trying to match the stimulus, we would need to find a weight that is appropriate that will challenge us for that one rep. You think about this workout, each round is going to take you somewhere around two minutes. The deadlift's obviously going to take a matter of seconds. The toes, the bar, somewhere around 20 to 30 seconds, so let's say 40 seconds for there, and then the burpees, a minute and a half, is going to be a steady pace to maintain. So if you're looking at, for a fitter, for a fitter athlete who can perform those burpees fast, performing 10 rounds, that's 10 reps on the deadlift, and we're looking at getting challenged on those last few reps. So you'd have to think about what weight is going to challenge me for that workout. For the toes to bar, think about whether you need to scale the volume of reps, Maybe 10 is too many for you because often we want people to perform the full range of motion whenever possible, but scale the number down. So we might say, okay, five reps. If you, if you do a set of three and a set of two, that might be a good way for a lot of people to do that. And even the burpees, 15 bar facing burpees, if it starts getting to the point where those 15 burpees are taking two, three minutes or longer, then we might think about either scaling the, the movement, more likely better to scale the volume of reps as well. With a 20 minute AMRAP, 
you are always looking at that workout being a long, steady grind with real constant work and short rest periods. You're not going to maintain super high intensity for 20 minutes. You're going to have to just try and work and find a pace you can con control throughout that workout. In terms of recreating that workout outside of the gym environment, there are a few challenges. The first one being the deadlift. Often with home workouts, the real limiting factor is the ability to get that much weight to challenge you. Most people won't have access to barbells with hundreds of kilos of weights to add to it, and therefore they need to find a way to adapt. One option is just to find the heaviest possible load you can and challenge yourself with that. Maybe an odd object at home, put a few bags together because you can add difficulty to that deadlift by if you're going to a lower position. Say, for example, you're picking up two heavy bags of compost. Well, the awkwardness of that load and the fact that you need to get your hands all the way down to the floor to pick it up may be adequate challenge to create a very similar stimulus. Alternatively, you could do a single leg variation and just complete one or two reps on each side. That way you won't need the full amount. You'd need less than half the weight to challenge yourself to that same amount. You could add some resistance bands to whatever bit of equipment you've got. That would be an easy way to make it more challenging. And the last resort would be to add more reps. That would be not as closely matching the stimulus, but it would weigh way of challenging yourself, working those muscles just on a slightly different way. But that's a way we can get close to that stimulus there. For the toes to bar, it's a gymnastic movement. It's an abdominal movement primarily, but it is also a grip strength movement. So we do lose some of that stimulus that we would have from doing a toes to bar if we're not able to hang. Obviously we could replace by doing some kind of leg raise with our hands in an L sit position or we could do a V up or an exercise where we hold a kettlebell overhead, lying on our floor and bringing our hands towards that kettlebell. They all do mirror that same abdominal move motion, but if we're looking to challenge the grip as well, it may be that we could have a little bit of variety, maybe something new is to add a carry or a hold before you do those toes to bar. If you wanted to challenge the grip more during that exercise, there could be some variation in there. But like I say, you won't be able to get an exact match without hanging from something. And the bar facing burpees, we can do those at home. Even if we've got limited space, what I normally extract people to do is that you still do a regular burpee, but a lot of people don't have 15 feet of room to be able to jump over to a burpee the other side. So therefore, what I say is you jump over, you jump back and you do a burpee the same side. And if you wanted to mirror it completely, you could rotate 180 degrees when you jump over the object the first time and then rotate 180 degrees back. So you're adding one more jump, um, but you're also recreating that, that rotating motion of a bar facing burpee that if you're going to then go back into the gym and try to get back into those bar facing burpees, you haven't then lost that ability. You're, you're still training that same factor. So there is a way to get close to the training stimulus, but it's important to know what that stimulus is and get as close as you can when you're matching it. The same could be said for the workout that a lot of us will remember, and that is Open 19.1. Those of you that are shorter athletes will definitely remember this as being one that really challenged you. That was very simple. Another 20-minute AMRAP of 19 wall balls, 19 calorie rows. So it's a great example of a similar workout, a grind. We just need to replace those two movements. So with the wall ball, most of us won't have nine, 10 foot ceilings to throw a ball to. So we could just replace it with a thruster. So that squat to press that we had in Fran. Rowing is a movement that when CrossFit first started and there wasn't access to many concept two rowers, it was actually replaced with a sumo deadlift high pull. And that's quite a good replacement because if you have a light, and it needs to be a light version because you think a rower, it's not a heavy load you're moving and the same for the wall ball, that needs to be light. It's not a heavy load, it's a constant load. So something light like a kettlebell or even just an empty barbell, going down and pulling up, you're getting that same pulling action. The muscles are moving on a very similar path. You're still going from hip flexion, knee flexion, hip extension and pulling up. That would be actually the closest way to replicate calories on a rower, more so 
than replacing it with another monostructural piece. But we often do one or the other. Most of the time, if we're running for distance, we'll replace it with a distance of running. So you could replace it with just simply running or performing a monostructural movement for that similar amount of time. I mean, both of these movements take around a minute each. So you could just do a minute of something that's similar monostructural work, running, skipping, biking, or you could get more close with something like a sumo deadlift high pull, but we can replace that, that stimulus. And again, the goal is to just keep moving constantly throughout. Sometimes we do have workouts that are single modality pieces. So there's only one movement in there. So I've talked before about a triplet, which we had the master, and we had a couple of couplets with Fran and um, the open workout. Merv, you could class as more of a, a chipper because you're going through all of those movements. And if you did it unpartitioned, that would be a classic chipper where you just do one big block. Now, a single modality would be something such as the workout Grace. Grace is 30 clean and jerks for time. How do we match that stimulus? Well, that workout at the time it was written, and we have to work, look at these workouts at the time they were written and not necessarily when we look at the CrossFit Games athletes now, because some people are completing that workout in a minute. So 30 reps in one minute. That's a rep every two seconds, if you didn't know that. That is not the stimulus for that workout. The workout is intended to be 30 quick singles or maybe blocks of five when you're doing that workout grace. If you're scaling grace and you're modifying grace, we're looking at a weight, so 65 normally, we're looking at a weight in which you can complete that work, sub five minutes, similar to kind of the Fran time. And therefore, you need to make sure you're choosing an appropriate load for that. So some of those games athletes now should be doing grace at a heavier weight, maybe 85 kilos, maybe even 90 kilos, or maybe even 100 kilos. You know, if you've got the, the top, top athletes, they may be able to do that 100 kilo one in under four minutes. So you have to look at how do we match that stimulus for that person, other people, they would need a much, much lighter load. So our newer athletes may do this with an, with an empty barbell. If you're doing it at home, again, it's just a matter of matching the intent of that workout. So it needs to be whatever object you have needs to be challenging to be able to do more than five in a row unbroken. You just have to think about that when you're choosing your weights and scaling your workouts appropriately. Don't just look at it and think, I will do whatever it says written there and I'll work it out. Think about what the stimulus of that workout is and choose an appropriate weight to match that. That way you're going to ensure that you are going to be getting the improvements in your performance and therefore the changes to your body that the person who has programmed the workout intends. And if we're looking at the CrossFit regime, the CrossFit training regime, I am programming to see improvement across multiple modalities all the different energy systems over a long period of time. And if you aren't getting the stimulus correct, then you won't be hitting all of those markers that I'm looking for and you won't see improvement across the board. You may see improvement in certain areas. So for example, if you decide to always go as heavy as possible whenever you do a workout, you may well feel that you'll get, you may well be getting stronger but that will come at the expense of one of the areas. So that will be maybe getting slower because you're only ever training at a, a, a lower intensity with a heavier load requiring large amounts of rest. So your workouts may take longer and therefore you may get slower. So it may be that if you're in between weights and you need to get faster, you think about going lighter and going faster. The same would be said if your coach has told you your technique is an issue and therefore you need to get that right because that's what's holding you back from the future. It may be that then your intent is to go lighter and focus on perfect technique and actually move slower. So you're, you might be sacrificing speed and strength at the expense of getting your technique better. And I would say that that, and I've spoken about this before, is a priority because if your technique is better, you will get an exponential improvement in your performance across the board. It's probably the fastest way for a lot of the movements that we do in CrossFit for you to get improvement in your performance is to get your technique right. And also the other benefit of that is that it's going to prevent injury, which can allow you to be more consistent. So you can modify workouts to suit your goals more specifically. For example, if you feel like you need to improve your cardio, 
you can go lighter and you can maybe work faster. If you improve your strength, you can go heavier and work slower. The key is to get that balance, but to realize that what, if, whatever you do, if you make, it, make a decision to do that, it will be at the expense of another area. And if we're looking to get complete improvement, then the, the goal is to stick with the stimulus that's intended. I hope this is making some sense to you guys. I know there's a lot of information to come on board here, but the key is, and I want people to get this right because I know that a lot of people training at home is to think about what the stimulus is required for that workout. So in other words, the first thing to think about is, am I moving the way that is intended? So if I'm having to adapt this workout at home, am I adapting it to something that is a very similar movement with the similar challenge. So am I choosing the weight that is going to give me the same challenge as that stimulus? That's the first thing we're gonna look at. Then am I working at the intensity that is intended for that workout? For example, if you have a workout where you are working for a very short period of time with a longer period of rest, then the, the intent of that workout is always going to be, you should be working as hard as possible during that short period of time with that long period of rest. And that's the same with, with sprinting, which is obviously training our um, ATP system, our number one energy system, our sprint energy system, or if we're doing heavy weights, the reason we have that long rest is because we will need it to recover before we do our next set. Think about the training stimulus. If you're unsure, ask the coach that's programmed the workout to explain it more clearly so you can scale that workout appropriately for you. What you'll discover when you've trained for a while is that certain weights are pretty consistent across the board. What you will see in the CrossFit workout here, and I'm gonna talk about the guys and the girls here, but when you see a guy's weight that is around 65 kilos and a girl's weight that is around 40 to 45 kilos, that is what we would call a moderate weight workout. So that's a workout in which we would expect you to be able to do at least a few reps unbroken, five to 10 reps unbroken through that. So especially when it's something that's overhead, generally 65 for anything overhead is considered a moderate weight, apart from maybe if you were snatching or overhead squatting, 45 for girls. If you see something that is lighter, like 45, then you know from the workout Fran, that is a workout in which you should be doing maybe 10 to 12 reps unbroken, therefore going a bit faster. So for you guys, that's a moderate to light weight. You go up to 85, so 40, sorry, 45 for guys, 30 for girls. We get up as high as 85 in these overhead workouts, then that's a heavy weight, and you know that single reps often is the case in that one. So you pick a weight that's that challenging for you, so 85 for guys. Somewhere, up, I think we're around 60 for girls is, is that kind of number. We know that's on the heavier side of the, of the spectrum, and that's how you look at your workout. So after time, you begin to learn those numbers. Now we could, I suppose, change the RX and just put heavy, medium, light, but it's good to have an aspirational number for people to work towards as well. So once you discover those numbers, you know that once you work towards the RX and you get to that point, that's quite rewarding for people knowing you're closer to closer to closer to that point is good. And like I say, there is debate as to whether RX should just be a generic number or it should be uh, just a guide to say heavy, light or, or moderate. I prefer the guys to work towards a number mainly because our athletes that can complete workouts, RX, are our most competitive athletes and they love to be able to compare scores. Adding the element of competition not only makes it more fun, but also raises intensity. People work that extra bit harder just to put a score on the board and raising that intensity can help to improve performance and the results that we get from our workouts. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and you found it useful. If you've got any questions on today's episode or previous episodes, please drop me a message, jeremy at crossfitchildren.com or some comments below. I'm happy to make some more of these based on what you guys want. So please let me know any suggestions for topics for future episodes. If you want to support this, like and subscribe, share it with your friends and leave a five-star review if you are listening to this on a podcast provider. Thanks for listening, guys. I'll speak to you all soon.